Amen. So 2 Timothy chapter 3 tonight, as we're making our way through the book. And of course, it starts out right there with that warning in verse 1 where it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And of course, the last days are referring to a, time, a, per, uh, a period of time that we find ourselves in. This isn't something that's coming in the future. This is a time that we are living in. You are living in perilous times right now. Uh, the last days is referring to a period of time. Really, it's, it's not just one. It's not a s very small uh, period of time, humanly speaking. I believe it spans from the time of Christ's ascension to the time he returns. I believe that's the time frame thereabouts that he's referring to. And if you would, of course, keep something in 2 Timothy 3, but turn back to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And we'll see this. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 2, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. I believe Isaiah there is prophesying toward, uh, of course, the millennial reign of Christ that's going to be established, and that would be the end of what we would refer to as the last days. That would be the end of it, when this time period that we call the last days is going to come to an end, is when... The Lord's house shall be established, and all nations shall flow into it. Okay, so it has a beginning and end, this time period. It starts, and it also has an end. And you're looking there in Acts chapter 2, look at verse 16. But this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants uh, and on my hand handmaids will I pour out... Uh, pour out uh, in those days of my spirit. So, of course, we know that was the day of Pentecost that he was referring to, and he refers to that time as the last days. Back in uh, the Apostles' Day, the early church's day, that, that particular time falls in that category of the last days, right? So we see in Isaiah where he says, look, it's going to end when all nations shall flow into the new Jerusalem when the, when the, when the Lord establishes, uh, uh, when he establishes his house on the top of the mountains. I believe that's the end of those last days. We see here in Acts chapter 2, um, when he is, uh, of course, this would be probably the beginning of the last days. When Christ ascends into heaven and he pours out his spirit upon his church, I believe this was the beginning. And then we find ourselves kind of right in there, right in between these two time frames, these points of time, in this time period called the last days. He says in Hebrews chapter 1, I'll read to you in verse 1, it says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son whom he appointed heir of all things. So <clears throat> we see again that it's even in Paul's day, he referred to it as these last days. And of course, that's a time period that we find ourselves in. We find ourselves in the last days. And what does First Timothy or Second Timothy tell us about the last days? That there'll be perilous times. And you know, that's and he goes into why what makes it so perilous. And you know, more important than understanding exactly when that time frame begins and ends and what exactly it's referring to. You know, that's important. It has its place. But more important than that is, is acknowledging the fact that it is the last days and being acknowledged and, and, and acknowledging the fact that it's perilous, acknowledging uh, that it's dangerous. What is important is to know the danger that will exist during this time. That's what God wants us to know. You know, instead of sitting around and trying to figure out and calculate exactly all these numbers or figure out exactly when it begins and ends, what's, what we need to know tonight, what we need to understand is that we're living in perilous times and that we're living in dangerous times. And why is it? Well, he says in verse 2, 2 Timothy 3, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. And he goes into this description of these people, <clears throat> and he says that's why these times will be perilous. Because you'll have people like this living. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, proud, boasters, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So he's saying, look, perilous times are going to come because men shall be all of these things. And what it starts out with is lovers of their own selves. The Bible says that it toward, uh, in, in the last days that the love of many shall wax cold towards the time of the end. Now it's talking about love towards one another. You know, that's why we're having living in perilous times because men are lovers of their own selves. It's a it's a it's the root of all these things that follow that that list there of verse, you know, 3 and 4. It all starts there in verse 2 where it says they are lovers of their own selves. 
And really, you know, it just shows us that the danger of having a self-centered and selfish attitude. If we go through life just worrying only about ourselves, living only unto ourselves, caring only what's best for us, you know, not thinking about things of others, not trying to bear one another's burdens, you know, you can develop a bad attitude. Now, I'm not going to say you're going to end up exactly like these people. We'll see here in a minute that this is referring to actual reprobates. But we could display these attributes, one or more of these attributes. I mean, these aren't things that are beyond even a Christian uh, having in his life. I mean, we could be lovers of our own selves. We could be covetous. We could be boasters. We could be proud. We could be all of these things. Now, there's some things I don't think we, we could be in this list, but there are quite a few of them that we could be. So we need to be careful that we don't fall into that. But again, what, why, is, why is it that he gives us this list? To tell us this is the reason why we're living in perilous times. is because people are just walking around with these attributes and they're reprobates. What sets these people apart in this list, yes, we could all share some of these same attributes, but what sets these specific people is the fact that these are reprobate people. Okay? They don't just have a few of these attributes. They have all of them. Okay? Go to Romans chapter 1. Keep set something in 2 Timothy chapter 3. But they display all of these attributes. Romans 1 tells us that they are filled with all unrighteousness. So it's not just they have a problem with this sin and that sin. No, they have all these sins. They, this is, this is defines who they are. This is what they are. They are all of these things. Notice the same downward spiral. If you would keep something in 2 Timothy 3 at the same time, we'll kind of, kind of flip back and look at these, these attributes at some of them. But notice they, they have the same downward spiral as in Romans 1. It says there in 2 Timothy 3, look at verse 5. Keep something in Romans 1. It says they, these people, you know, and we have all those attributes, and it says in verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. So they have a form of godliness. They look spiritual. They sound spiritual. You know, they might, they might even say spiritual things. They have a form of godliness. They look okay on the outside, but they deny the power of. There, but, but not deny the power thereof. He's talking about false prophets. He's talking about reprobates. He's about people that are going to sneak into churches or false denominations, people who are going to preach Christ, but they deny the power thereof. Now look there in Romans 1, verse 18. You see the same thing. The Bible says in verse 18 in Romans 1, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So it's not that they don't have the truth. It's what they're doing with it. They have the truth, but they're holding it in unrighteousness. They're doing it for filthy lucre's sake. They're involved in the things of Christ. They're getting into, you know, they have a, a religious, they're wolves in sheep's clothing, the Bible tells us. So they have, they have the form of godliness. They hold the truth, but they deny the power thereof. They hold it in unrighteousness. Okay? Look at verse 21, Romans 1. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Okay, they knew God, but they didn't glorify Him. They, had, they denied the power thereof. They neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So the Bible is telling us about a group of people that they hold the truth in righteousness. It's not that they never had the truth. They had the truth. It's not that they didn't have uh, godliness. They just denied the power of it. Okay? They knew God, but they didn't glorify Him as God. And what happened as a result? They became vain in their imaginations, it goes on and says, and their foolish heart was darkened. And it was God that did the darkening of their foolish heart. You know, the Bible is really clear that there's people out there in the world that are reprobate, meaning that God has given them over. God has given up on these people. They're beyond the hope of salvation. You know, and we all, for the most part, probably understand this in this room tonight because it's something that's preached across this pulpit and our pastor preaches it quite often, you know, as often as needed. It's not a, it's not a foreign uh, doctrine to us. It's something we're very familiar with. But there's a lot of churches today that deny this. There's a lot of churches, even Baptists, that want to, to say this isn't so. But the Bible's very clear that there are men, there are people that God rejects. Now, God, they say, well, God loves everybody. Yeah, God did love everybody at one point. But when they have the form of godliness and deny the power of when they hold the truth and unrighteousness, when they know God and refuse, him not, and refuse to glorify Him not as God and became vain in their imaginations, God, God goes ahead and gives them up. That's what it says in Romans 1. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And that's why we're living in perilous times. Because we're seeing these type of people on every hand. Okay? And, they're, and they're, you know, these type of people, they're given over to all unrighteousness. 
you know, the sins of the flesh, to do those things which are not convenient. They, they, they fall into sins that are not natural to man. Okay, you know, we, there are certain sins that every, every one of us is tempted with that are just natural to man. And then there's other sins that people get into that are not natural to man. That they're, they're, they're sins that only an animal would do. That's why the Bible calls them brute beasts. <clears throat> and that's why we're living in perilous times. Because we have these type of people with these attributes that have been given over to reprobate mind walking and talk and living amongst us today. You know, and a, and a great example is that and the fact that, you know, I believe, I believe it's this Saturday or maybe it's the next one. Sometime this month coming up, even Tucson itself is going to have their own fag pride parade where they're all going to march up and down the street with all their filth and parade their filth up and down these streets. And those people are reprobate, friend. Those people are sick, perverted people who need to go back in the closet. But we're living in perilous times today because no one wants to stand up and say that. No one wants to call them out for what they are. Everyone wants to embrace them and say, oh, isn't it wonderful? You know, I don't suggest you go and look at it. I don't suggest you've ever, you know, go online to see what, what goes on at these parades. But, you know, unfortunately, some people <laughs> have posted this stuff on social media and you can't help but see it when it comes across your feed. There's some sick stuff going on down there. A bunch of perverts is what they are. They're reprobate. And, set, and that's why we're living in perilous times. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, and they'll be all of these things. And they're going to be reprobate. They're going to be given over. It says in verse 6 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is the perfect description of a reprobate. Somebody who is ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You could, tell, you could give these people the gospel, they could understand it, but they'll never come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And I've done it. I, you know, people are going to get all mad at us and say, oh, how unloving of you. But you know what? we going out door to door, week in and week out. We've probably preached the gospel to more reprobates than these other people ever will, than our critics ever will. On accident, without even trying, you know. And if I figure out they're a reprobate, then yeah, I don't bother wasting my time preaching the gospel. But I guarantee you I've preached the gospel to somebody that is not even able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, just talking about it, I think of this one young guy came to the door and just before I got to the door, I, I, I just felt like the Holy Spirit was trying to tell me something. You know, of course, I don't believe he's audibly speaking to me, but you can feel the leading of the Spirit. And I'm just thinking, I'm about to learn something at this door. And I knock this door and this young guy comes. You know, he's got the long hair. I'm not saying just because you have long hair, you're reprobate, but you know, <laughs> he looked like a femi. And he kind of said some things. I was like, well, this, you know, and he kind of had some things. I thought, well, maybe, but I gave him the benefit of the doubt. And I gave him the whole gospel, and he said, yeah, that's, he said, that's probably all true, but I don't believe it. And, he, and, I, and I walked away, and I just felt like the Holy Spirit was telling me, that's the perfect example of somebody who was not able to come to knowledge of the truth. They understood everything, but they did not want to receive it. Okay, and that's what reprobates, they can know the truth, but they're never, they're never going to come to a saving knowledge of it. They can, they'll ever be learning. They'll always, you know, you could tell them everything there is, but it's never going to get to a point where they can actually be saved. <coughs> and you know the Bible makes it real clear that there's people like this. Go ahead and turn over to Mark chapter four. Mark chapter four. This is not a strange concept. And people will say, "Oh, you know, uh, Pastor Anderson came up with this." You know, I heard about this doctrine long before I even knew who Pastor Anderson was. This used to be something that was very common, commonly taught in the old IFB. This reprobate doctrine, and unfortunately, it's gone by the wayside. And that's the re as a result, we're living in perilous times. Because no one's preaching against these people. And everyone's backing down. Everyone's cowering and just rolling over for these people. <coughs> and it says there, you know, in Mark 4, that the, it tells, it'll show us some people that are ever learning and not able to come to the truth, even if they wanted to. Look at verse 11. He said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. So Jesus is talking to his disciples, right? And they asked him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He says, Look, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of God. You get to know these mis the mysterious things of God, the things that are hidden. But unto them that are without, these things are done. In, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sin should be forgiven. 
should be forgiven them. There are some people that God hides the truth from and says they're not going to receive the truth. And, it's, and who is it? It's the people that, just as they do not like to retain God in their knowledge, God says, well, I'm going to forget about you too then. <coughs> you know, this is not a hard concept to understand. Jeremiah 6, verse 30, explains it very clearly what it means to be reprobate. It means to be rejected of God. Okay? It says, and if you wanted to turn there, you could, or you could look it up later, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 30, a verse we should know, right? It says, reprobate silver shall men call them, Talking about people, he says these people are going to be called reprobate silver. This is a term of derision that people are going to use to describe these people. They're going to call them reprobate. Why? Because the Lord hath rejected them. Why are they called reprobate? Because God rejected them. You can't tell me there aren't people that God rejects when there's a verse that said that God rejected them. It's, I believe the Bible. Not your logic, not your, not your feelings. You know, not because you have a soft spot for, you know, whoever that you know that would fall into this qualification, these, one of these, uh, into this classification of being a reprobate. You know, the Word of God says very clearly, and we, we looked at just a few verses, that God rejects people. And go back, go, you know, if you question that, go read Romans 1. God gave them over, God gave them over, God gave them up. Talks about that. <coughs> and now look at there in um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 28. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 1 is where we were. Romans 1. So it says, Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. Even, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God then gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So what is a reprobate mind? It's a mind that God has rejected. It's, a person, it's the mind of a person whom God has given over and given up on. <clears throat> and that's what, the, the, in 2 Timothy, you could turn back there now, 2 Timothy Keep something in Romans 1, but 2 Timothy. <clears throat> and that's what, these are the type of people that, Tim, that Paul is describing in 2 Timothy 3. He's describing reprobates. He says in verse 8, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. And it's not like they hear the truth and get right. They resist it. They don't even want to retain God as knowledge. They, want him to, they don't even want to acknowledge that he exists. They resist the truth. God, it says, and, uh, these do resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. These people cannot be saved. And that's why we're living in perilous times. Romans 1, 2 Timothy 3, describe the same people with the same attributes. If you compare these lists, you go through it. These are some of the attributes they, both, they share that are named in both lists. Okay? Covetous, boasters, proud. I mean, that's, that's an applicable one today, proud, right? With their pride parade. That's not a coincidence. You know, that, that falls right into what the Bible is describing. Proud, disobedient to parents without natural affection. Truce breakers, and coven truce breakers or covenant breakers. It means the same thing. So that's why we're living in perilous times. Because of the fact that there are, there are reprobates that are living in this world. And there's less people preaching against them there's, and more people. This, we're living in a, a culture and a society that is tolerating them to the point where they're letting them walk up and down their city streets, blocking off, blocking off streets and inviting everyone in town to come down and watch them and applaud them and, and be grateful that they're there and put their stickers up and, and change their profile picture on Facebook to, to show their support for the LGBT HIV community. <clears throat> that's why we're living in perilous times. And we need to be warned about this because these people, they're, they are given over to a reprobate. You know what that means? They're willing to do anything. They will harm, the Bible says they go after, they will beguile unstable souls. That's talking about children. You know, and, and I don't want to dwell too much on that tonight. I mean, but the Bible does address it. And we need to just make sure that we're being vigilant and understanding the times that we're living in. That there are, these are perilous times because of these sick perverts that are living with us. <clears throat> but look at verse 9. You say, well, you're pointing kind of a bleak picture, Brother Corbin. Well, you know, that's the reality that we're living in. You know, thank God, God doesn't sugarcoat everything. That he just, he warns us. You know, he doesn't just cover our eyes and ears and say, there's nothing to see here, don't worry about it, and just lets us go headlong into some disaster and ruin our lives. He says, no, look out. You know, watch out. There's, you know, you're living in perilous times. You need to take heed. And understand what you're dealing with here. Understand the times that you're living in. 
But verse 9 gives us a glimmer of hope, right? It says, but they shall proceed no further. Amen. For their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Look, we're living in perilous times. We're living in the last days. But these days are going to come to an end. You know what? When it comes to an end, they shall proceed no further. You know, their time, they, they, you know, go, go enjoy your pride parade, fag. Because that's the best you're going to get. It's going to come to an end one day. It's all going to end for them. And you know what? In the back of their minds, they know it. I believe that. I believe in the back of their minds, they know what they are and who God is and what's going to happen. They know it's going to come to an end. You ever wonder why these homos all flock to some of the most beautiful places in the world? Why whenever you're in like some, you know, you, you go to some desirable community in a nice area, that's where you find them? You find them in the Pacific Northwest in Portland. That's a beautiful country up there. You know, where I'm from in, in Michigan, Traverse City, beautiful part of the country. Movie stars go up there, CEOs build their homes, mansions everywhere, very tourist community, a lot of fags. It was, the, it, was the, it was called the San Francisco of the Midwest. There were more homos per capita in the city where I came from at one time than even San Francisco because it was beautiful northern Michigan. They flocked to these places. Southern California, great weather, beaches, a lot of eggs. Florida, you know, they're not going to Arkansas. You know, <laughs> you don't find them in, you know, Kansas City, Missouri. I'm sure they're there, but they're not flocking there. Because they know this is the best it's going to get for them is this earth, this life, and then it's over. Because you know what? They shall proceed no further, the Bible says. They're going to have their day. They're going to have their hour in the power of darkness. And then one day, it's done. And praise God for that. Their time will come to an end. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 1, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. You know, is this troubling you? Are you vexed by these people? You know, you should be. If it doesn't vex you that this stuff is going on in our towns, that these people aren't being promoted on every billboard and magazine and television program that there is. They're not, we're just being bombarded by this homo agenda every single day of our life. That our kids are being brainwashed in public schools to be accepting of this crap and this filth. Yep. That should vex you. It should bother you. It should trouble you. Amen. But you know what? And hopefully it does. And if it does trouble you, you know what? Rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ shall come. Amen. When he shall come from heaven with his mighty, zambl, uh, with his, with his mighty angels. And he goes on to read what he's going to do. He's going to clean house. He's going to take care of business. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says God's going to come and light them up. Yeah. Then there'll be, the, uh, uh, then it'll be a different type of flamer. Right. <laughs> it'll be a literal flamer on fire. Ah! <laughs> they shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. You know what? They don't want anything to do with God. God's happy to oblige them. And when he comes, they won't have anything to do with him. So, you know what? This is, this is a negative part of Scripture. It's a negative reality that we have to face. But they shall proceed no further. It's going to come to an end. It says in verse 32 of Romans 1, I'll read to you, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They know the judgment of God. It's in the back of their minds. They know what they are. They know what's coming to them. So we should be vigilant. We should understand the times that we're living in and not walk around, you know, thinking that everything's just fine. You know, everything's not just fine. You know, the world is a dark place and we need to be on our guard. We have to keep our guard up. We need to be vigilant, be sober. For our, our, our ever see the, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So let's not fall victim to him. <clears throat> you know, and then Paul, he, he goes on here, and, he, and you know, he's admonishing him, he's warning Timothy, he's saying, look, perilous times, these are the type of people that you're going to have to deal with. Things are going to get worse. He goes on in verse 10 in 2 Timothy 3, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. So he's saying, but you know me, Timothy. What's he doing here? He's admonishing him to follow his example. He's saying, look, don't, don't let this get, to get you down. Don't be a fool. You know, be vigilant, but continue to do as I have done. He's saying we should, you should follow his example. And that's what we need to do today. In perilous times, we need to follow the example of Paul and others like him. People who are living godly for Christ. 
That's, we ought to follow his example as how to live in these last days. Then he gives a list there, right, of some things that, you know, hey, these are some things you should know. These are some things you know about Paul. These are some things about Paul that we could follow after. These are some of the things that are an example to us. And what is it that we know about Paul? He gives us a list. He says, you have fully known my doctrine, right? <clears throat> so, the one of the, you know, we should know the doctrine, like Paul. We should understand what it is that he taught. And, you know, this doctrine that I just taught you or preached to you from the Word of God is a good one to know. The reprobate doctrine. It's important. We should know it because of the times we're living in. And, you know, and, we, and, and, and Paul's saying, look, you fully know my doctrine. And Paul taught the same doctrine. He taught the reprobate doctrine. And he didn't do it in private. He didn't do it in secret. He wrote it down in the Bible for everybody to read. Amen. You know what that tells me? That we shouldn't be hiding the things that we believe. Amen. I guarantee you there's a lot of Baptists out there that believe this doctrine about reprobates. But they won't ever say it publicly. They will never say it from their pulpits. They'll never warn their people. They'll ne you know, I, I learned, when I learned about it before I, I knew Pastor Anderson, I didn't learn it from the pulpit. I had to listen to a pastor kind of make, you know, allude to it and kind of figure it out on my own a little bit. You know, in private conversation. It was never preached across the pulpit. There's a lot of that going on. Is that the example of Paul, though? He says, no, you fully know my doctrine. You understand what I believe, Timothy. And so do we, because Paul, everything he believed, he taught publicly. We have nothing to hide about what we believe. And I'm never going to be ashamed of this doctrine. And that's the problem with so many preachers. Today. They're ashamed of things the Word of God. Even, you know, and, and you could kind of understand a little bit, you know, humanly speaking, that, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's uncomfortable. You know, you get some backlash. I mean, people get pers I mean, we know pastors have gotten persecuted for preaching this doctrine. You know, they didn't back down. They didn't apologize. They stood on their... You know, you could kind of understand a little bit, like I said, I'm not saying it's right, but how some people might want to kind of shy away from a doctrine that's become so controversial, right, in, the, in this culture. It's so countercultural to what we've been uh, brought up to believe. But there's even, there's, there, there's other things that they're ashamed of in the Word of God that they never preach, that their people need to hear. They'll never preach on sins. I'm not saying even sins that reprobates are guilty of, just normal, everyday sins. Pastors don't want to get up today and they don't want you to fully know that doctrine. They don't want to preach it publicly. They just want to preach all the nice, soft, gentle things. They want to do the nine-week series on grace and love and peace and joy. And those things are great to talk about and preach about, and we should learn those things too, but we want the whole counsel of God. And we want things that are going to help us to survive and live in these last days because these are perilous times that we're living in. You know, we have to, you know, but there's a lot of pastors today that preachers, they don't even want to preach things that are even less controversial. You know, I don't want to get into all what they are. That's <coughs> right at this point. We've preached about them here. But, you know, Jesus has a strong warning for people like that. Go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Jesus said in Mark 8, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I mean, we're, we're going we're gonna to blush and, and, and shy away and, and be bashful about preaching God's word to a bunch of adulterous, wicked people? No. We should not be ashamed of... They're the ones that should be ashamed, friend. They are. The ones that are out there. These, these homos that are going to be marching up and down the streets here in, in a few days. They're the ones that ought to be ashamed. Not us. And I don't know exactly when. Somebody told me the date. It kind of just came to me of when this parade is supposed to go on. So if it's not this weekend, you know, don't, don't come up to me at the service and say, hey, actually, it's, you know, <laughs> it's going to happen here in the next week or two or something like that. You know, sometime real soon. You know, but they're the ones that ought to be ashamed. Not us. You know, we, you know we're not going to be ashamed of God's words in an adulterous and sinful generation. Because imagine that. Imagine being ashamed of that. That's, and, then, and then God being ashamed of you when you stand before him. And he says, well, what, you know, now I'm ashamed of you. I, you know, that, I would rather have, <clears throat> I'd rather upset the people in this world than have God be ashamed of me over his word. Well, why didn't you preach that? Why didn't you teach that? You know, why didn't you tell, why didn't you tell people uh, what the Bible said? Well, you know, I didn't know how they'd take it. You know, I was probably going to upset somebody. 
Well, now I'm ashamed of you. And I've got that on my head for all eternity. No thanks. <laughs> you know, that goes for every one of us. You know, whether it's in the workplace, with our families, we should never be ashamed of the Word of God. <clears throat> what does it say in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14? Do all things without murmuring and disputings. They may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without, re without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. You know why I'm not ashamed of the word of God? Because it's the word of life. Because it's that word, it's the word that's going to bring life to people. It's the word that's going to save souls. It's the word that's going to change lives. It's the word that's going to get people out of sin and living for God. That's why I'm not ashamed of it. Because it's the words of life. And, we're, and it's in the midst of it. We hold it forth in the midst of a perverse and crooked nation. And mark it down. That's the nation we're living in today. We are living in the midst of a perverse and crooked nation. You know, and if you haven't been listening to me rant and rave for the last 20 minutes or whatever about the homos, you know, you, you, let me go on it again. <laughs> you know, is there any doubt we're living in a perverse in, in, in nation, in a crooked nation that has forgotten, off, forgotten God? So Paul's saying, look, I know we're living in the last days, but follow my example. You have fully known my doctrine. You know, we shouldn't be ashamed of what we believe. Paul wasn't. That was his example. He, we knew his doctrine. He said, you know my manner of life back there in, in 2 Timothy verse 10. Go to Philippians chapter 3. 2 Timi or Philippians chapter 3. He says, you know about my manner of life, the way he lived his life. You know what's great about Paul? It says, walk matched his talk. He wasn't just saying one thing and doing another. He said, look, Paul, Timothy, you know me, that I practice what I preach. And that's the type of people we want to be. We want to people, because here's the thing, your walk talks more than your talk talks. And we can talk all day, but if we're not living it, you know, that's not going to be good. Now it says there, he goes on and says, you know my, my doctrine, my manner of life, and he says, you know my purpose. You know, Paul had a purpose. You know, you want to survive in these last days, you got to have a purpose. You got to have a goal. You got to have some direction in your life. Spiritually speaking, you should have something to achieve in this life spiritually. Philippians chapter 3, look at verse 7. Paul said, But what things were gained to me, those I counted, for lo I counted loss for Christ, say doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, my, uh, Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Look at verse, uh, verse 13. He says, Brethren, I count not myself to apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are, which are behind, I am reaching forth unto those things which were before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of Christ Call calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's his purpose. Pressing towards the mark, the, uh, the, the, for the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That was his purpose. Forgetting those things are which are behind. You know, a lot of times people don't accomplish what they could in, in life not because they don't have a goal, they don't have a direction. It's, not, it's because they're spending too much time worrying about the past. Worrying about people that they don't even hang around anymore. You know, that's like one of the weirdest things. I, I've had that happen to me. I'll be, you know, I was just talking to my wife about it the other night. You know, I'm laying in bed trying to go to sleep and then I'll just start thinking about somebody that I knew 20 plus years ago. And I'm sitting there thinking about it. And I'm going, this person probably doesn't even give me a second thought. So then I'll turn over and I'll just stare at my wife. You know, and just say, hey, you know, bring me back in the moment. You know, this is the person I should be worried about. I'm not sitting here thinking about some friend from 20 years ago some stupid memory, you know, forgetting those things which are behind. You know, we, we can't press, we, sh we don't, we need to have a purpose and we need to press toward the mark. You can't do that if you're, if you're always looking backwards. You know, Jesus said, uh, uh, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven, you know, if you put your hand to the plow and looking back. I know I'm paraphrasing, right? <laughs> he said, he that putteth his hand to the plow and look at that is not fit for the kingdom of heaven because you're not focused on the goal where you're headed. You know, you need to look forward. You need to have a purpose. This is the example that Paul gives us. You want to make, you know, you want to get your mind off of the filth and the perversion that's around us? Quit looking around at it so much. You know, try to get it out of your eyes as much as you can. Try not to dwell on it. Have a purpose. 
You know, get up and read the Bible. Serve God. Go to church. Preach the gospel. Memorize scripture. Focus. Get some purpose behind your life. He says, you know my purpose. He said, you've known my faith. Right? Paul was an example of somebody who didn't doubt. You know, somebody who had faith. He said, you've known my long suffering. And, you know, he goes on and says, and, and he says, long suffering, charity, and patience. And you think, well, long suffering and patience, isn't that the same thing? Yeah, I mean, you could kind of say it is, but I think it's, it's different. Okay, there's a difference there. He's saying long suffering. What was Paul's long suffering? What does it mean to be long suffering? Long suffering, I believe, is putting up with people and circumstances. You know, it's putting up, you know, and it's being long suffering towards somebody. Being, you know, you can look at that as being patient, but I believe specifically that's what he's, uh, what he's talking about. And that, these are attributes that we have to have. We need to be long suffering with people, you know, willing to give them the benefit of the doubt, letting people grow, you know, not just, you know, they, they you preach in the gospel, they don't believe it, reprobate, and just walk away, right? I preached the gospel to them once and they said, no, now they must be a reprobate. No. You know, maybe you just need to be a little more long suffering. Maybe, they, you know, not everyone gets it the first time, the second time, the third time. Everybody's different. But some people, they're just, they get this thing going where it's just like, if they don't receive it, you know, immediately at that moment, then, they, then they're just reprobate. You know, I've heard people say that over the years. You know, I, I preached the gospel to my family member and they, they rejected it. I think they're reprobate. I think you're not long suffering. <laughs> That's the problem. You know, maybe you just need to be a little more long suffering with these people. So he's saying, you know, putting up with people, putting up with circumstances. He says, uh, you know my purpose, uh, you know my manner of life, you know my faith, my long suffering. He said, you know my charity. And, you know, Paul was a very loving person. And, you know, it, it, what did that do? What was the result? It wasn't just that he was always just saying the nice things and, and sending people nice cards and, you know, the way we think of loving sometimes and just, you know, writing everybody notes and sending them chocolate. You know, he, he, his life's purpose was to love people. And what did that motivate him to do? To preach the gospel. You know, that was the most love. You know, preaching the gospel to somebody is the most loving thing you can do. You know, you want to love somebody? Preach in the gospel. You want to go love your neighbor? Preach in the gospel. And be patient with them. Be long-suffering. And, you know, he says, you know my faith, my long-suffering, my charity, my patience. So... <clears throat> You know, we know that we're living in the last days, these perilous times. And we know that there's going to be a time when they shall proceed no further, that their time will come to an end. But until that happens, we have to be patient. And that's what Paul's talking about, I believe, here. That's an, one of the attributes of Paul that we need to have in our own life. You know, if we're going to make it through, you know, without, you know, losing our minds, you know, we've got to be patient. We have to be willing to handle the weight for that which is to come. You know, Paul said he, he had a desire to depart and to be with the Lord for it is far better. But he said it's more needful for you that I abide in the flesh. You know, we, we want to go be with the Lord. We want this all to end. But you know what? There's a lot of people that will still get saved today. There's a lot of people that we know and love and even total strangers that we don't know and can still love that will get saved. And that's why we need to be patient and wait for the, for the Lord. You know, be patient under the coming of Christ and, and wait for it. And uh, <laughs> not just get this attitude of like, when is this going to end? You know, and I, and I, believe me, I know that feeling. Like, it's enough already. You know, I've seen enough guys and drag for one lifetime. Please end it. I've seen enough human suffering for one lifetime. Let's just, can we just get it over with? You know, and end this. Even so, come Lord Jesus, right? Yeah. But at the same time, we have to be patient and be willing to wait. I mean, Paul was a very patient person. Look at all the circumstances that he put up with. All the things that he suffered and all the things that, you know, that he went through. <clears throat> and all these, these attributes, you know, this faith, this long-suffering, this charity, this patience, these are all attributes that are necessary to handle what's going to come in the Christian life. Because you're guaranteed to one thing in the Christian life is if you're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, you shall suffer persecution. That's what it says in verse 12. You know, if you're going to live for the Lord, if you're going to live a biblical life, you're going to be persecuted. So you have to have these attributes because of what's going to come. Look there in verse 11. He said that you, uh, he, he said, uh, you've known my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my charity, my patience. And he goes on in verse 11. We like all that, right? Those are such noble qualities. Yeah, we would love to have those. 
But look at verse 11. Can we say we'd like to have this? We would like to follow Paul's example here. You've known my persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, without of them the Lord delivered me. So <clears throat> that's why we have to have all these attributes. Because persecutions and afflictions come in this, <clears throat> in this life. And what I want to draw your attention to there is he said he endured them. Right? He said, which pers what persecutions I endured. Okay? Now, a lot of people today want to read that and say, persecutions I avoided. That's not what it says, though. And there's a big difference between enduring persecution and avoiding it. It's not the same thing. A lot of people want to dodge persecution. And what do they do? They don't make their doctrine fully known. They start to hold back the Word of God. Or they start to drop standards in their life. Or they stop, you know, they stop going to the church because the family gets, starts getting after them about whatever. Oh, you're associated with that guy? You know? And the next thing you know, well, you know, uh, and you, now you're ashamed. You're ashamed of, of God's man. You're ashamed of God's word, what's being preached. And you're ashamed before men in, in the midst of an adulterous generation. Why? Because you're avoiding persecution. You're not enduring persecution. Paul endured it. He didn't avoid it. Because he knew it was going to come. That's why he says in verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly shall suffer persecution. That's a guarantee in the Christian life. That everyone, notice those words, all and shall. There's no exceptions to this. You know, it's not just for the man behind the pulpit. You know, it's just not for the guy preaching the word. It's for everybody. Because if you're going to walk out those doors and live a godly... Now, you can't avoid it by not living godly in Christ Jesus. But if you're going to walk out these doors and actually apply the Word of God to your life, mark it down, you're going to, be su you're going to suffer persecution. To some degree or another. You know, but it's going to be there because that's what the verse says. Either, either everyone in this room that decides to live godly for Christ Jesus is going to suffer persecution or God's a liar. That's the two options. Because it says right there, all shall suffer persecution. <coughs> You know, and some people choose not to live godly in Christ Jesus because they understand that to be true. They say, yep, that's true. They acknowledge that verse. They say, that is true. So they find, instead of enduring persecution, they avoid it. Not everyone is going to live godly because, they, because of that certainty of persecution. They're not going to be like Paul. They're going to they're back out. The Bible says in Matthew 13, don't read to you, but he that received the seed into stony places the same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it. He likes the Bible. He likes what it says. He receives the word. Yet he hath not root in himself, but dureth for a while. They hang in there for a little bit. For when tribulation or persecution arises, ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. I mean, they like the part about salvation. They like the part about you know, you know, salvation by grace through faith. And they get saved. They receive that part of the word. But then come all the thou shalt and the thou shalt nots, the do's and don'ts of the Bible. You know, and, and the hard stands that have to be taken. And now, by and by, these people are offended. They have no root in themselves. They don't allow the Word of God to go deep down and establish them. And they're offended. They don't endure persecution. They avoid it. So, you know, it's important that, you know, Paul here, he's warning these people. He's saying, look, he's warning Timothy and saying there's perilous times coming. Then he puts himself out as an example to try and encourage Timothy to, to, to not avoid persecution, but to endure it, to follow him in his footsteps, to follow his example. And, you know, it's important for us today to have examples to look at just as Timothy had Paul. You know, we have Paul, of course, as our as example as well because of Scripture. But we also have, should have examples that we look to. The Bible says in Colossians 2, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. You know, being rooted, being built up, being established, that's something that has to be taught. You know, and that's what's going on tonight. You know, trying to root you, establish you, and build you up by teaching you what? That persecution is going to come. That we're living in perilous times. You know, and there's a lot of other things that go on, and that's what takes place, you know, three times a week with the preaching of the word of God. It's all there to build, to 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 edify the saints, to for the edif you know, to build the body of Christ, to root you, to establish you, to build you up, 
so that by and by you're not offended and fall away. <coughs> we have to have examples in front of us, just like Timothy and Paul. You know, other Christians around us, preachers, you know, the Word of God itself. We have to look to these examples in the Word of God and people around us that are living for Christ and follow in their footsteps and follow and, 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 and do what they have taught us. I mean, and that way, if, if, that way we can be rooted and built up and not become offended. What that tells us there, he says in Colossians 2, as ye have been taught, you know what that tells me? Is that these things that we learn from the Word of God, they're not innate in the Christian life. They don't come, they're not just going to come naturally. You're not just going to wake up one morning and be built up and grounded and rooted in the faith. You have to work at that. Right? I mean, you know, like the idea of being root, having a root in yourself, having your roots go down, that takes time. They have to grow. They have to get in there and, and get hold. It doesn't just happen. You know, you don't just put a seed in the ground and all of a sudden it's an oak tree. It has to germinate. It has to have roots. It has to grow. And it's the same with us. We have to be taught these things because they're not inborn in the Christian life. They're not just naturally there. They're things that have to be learned and applied to our lives. And, you know, this verse, and I, <laughs> I know it's kind of a downer sermon maybe a little bit to get up here and tell you, look, it's perilous times, persecution's assured, and, you know, living the Christian life isn't just this walk in the park. It's not a bed of roses. I mean, it has its ups and downs, right? But here's the thing. We know the end from the beginning. We know what's coming ahead. We know of heaven. We know Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. We have that hope in us. That Christ is going to come and receive us unto Himself. You know, and that carries us in life and that gives us hope and inspires us and, move, and moves us. But here's the thing, that comes later. <laughs> not now. You know, everyone, everyone wants heaven now, but that's not the way it works. Right now, it's suffering. Right now, it's persecution. Right now, it's, it's all these things. Why? Because of our surroundings. Because we're living in the midst of a perverse and wicked nation. So we need to think soberly about these things. I mean, look at verse 13 there. Paul doesn't paint a pretty picture of what, li what lies ahead for the Christian in this world, okay? In this life. He says, but, verse 13, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. All right, Paul, one worse was enough, man. Take it easy on us. And he's kind of laying it down. He's kind of just laying it bare. Look, this is the Christian life. Persecutions, afflictions. Long suffering, perilous times, evil men, seducers, waxing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Look, I wouldn't get you do, do you any favors if I if I didn't get up here and tell you tonight. It's going to get worse before it gets better. And you think this is the parade that's going to take place here is the worst thing that's going to happen? It's going to get worse, friend. It's going to get worse and worse. I mean, those of us that have lived, you know, a few decades have probably, at the least, can, igno can acknowledge that. Has it not gotten worse and worse in this culture? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a young man. And I remember just 20 years ago, it was, you did not see and hear the things that are going on right now to this degree. It, it's, it's, it's just out of control. We, this, we are on a bobsled to hell in this country, just rocketing towards it. I mean, it's just craziness. It was 10, 15 years ago, everyone was up in arms about homos getting married. You know, now they're, now, but now they're adopting. Now they're marching up and down in every city in America. And now you've got men of God cowering behind the pulpits, not afraid to preach it. Welcoming them into the churches, into independent Baptist churches, saying, come on in, sit down. Join the children's ministry. These fools. But they're going to wax worse. It's not over yet. It's going to get worse. So buckle up. You know, that's, that's the admonition tonight. Get built up. Get rooted in the faith. Get in church. Get in your Bible. Follow the examples you've been given. Have a purpose. You know, do these things. Follow in Paul's footsteps. It's going to get worse and worse, but here's the thing. Don't give up hope because when it gets better, when, it finally, when that ends and it finally gets better, it's going to be better than it's ever been. It'll be the best it's ever been. When Christ returns and establishes His kingdom, 
and he, and he takes vengeance and flaming fire on those that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to be the best this world's ever been. Amen. And we're going to be there. If we're saved, if we're born again, we're going to rule and reign with him. Paul said that <coughs> he, you know, he, he, the sufferings of this life cannot be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in him. You can't even compare it. We'll get in heaven, we'll look back at the things we suffered and endured, it'll seem like nothing. And now, right now, it might not seem that way. Now it's hard, now it's difficult, now it's all, it's afflictions, it's persecutions, it's evil men waxing worse and worse, it's difficult. But I guarantee you, when we get to heaven and we look back, we'll be like, that was nothing. Let's do it again. Well, no, we won't say that, but. <laughs> but it'll seem like it. Right? We, it won't even compare to the glory which will be revealed in us. You'll say, Lord, was that it? You look around at heaven and all its glory and all its beauty, you'll see Jesus Christ himself. You know, and if you served him in this life, he'll give you a crown of, and, you know, multiple crowns, set you over a city or ten or whatever, make you a ruler, make you a king, make you a priest in the house of our God. And you'll say, I didn't do anything. You'll wish you'd suffered more for his name. <clears throat> it'll seem like nothing, friend. But on this side of eternity, it's heavy. You know, because we're still looking through, you know, eyes of flesh. You know, we, we see through a glass darkly. And we need to understand that, you know, things are going to, when they do get better, that it's going to be the best they've ever been. But until then, it's going to get worse and worse. You know, and we need to stay focused. You know, we need to look forward to that and keep our hope. Everyone wants to kind of keep looking back and talk about the good old days. You ever hear people do that? Well, I remember back in my day, and they always talk about the good old days. Well, I heard somebody say this once, and I thought this is really good. This is a really good perspective. This right, these days, right now that you're living in, these are the good old days. Because think about it. If it's going to get worse and worse, as bad as things are today, things are going to get worse and worse. You're going to look back to today and go, those were the good old days. Yeah. You're living in the good old days right now. Think about it that way. These are the good old days. Because it's going to get worse. <laughs> you know, I don't know if that brings any, any ray of hope into your life, but hopefully, you know, it's perspective. You know, one day we're going to look back to this time and consider how much less wicked it was. We'll say, remember when they just used to have a parade once a year? They used to just go out there and have their filth, their fun in the sun, and march up and down the street, and we could just stay at home and ignore it? There'll be time when that's what we wanted. He said it's going to be as, as in the days of Lot. <laughs> Think about that. How wicked was Sodom? The greatest unto the least from every quarter came to know those men when the angels came in. Every man in that city. And things are going to get really bad <laughs> before it gets better. But, he says in verse 14, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned. Don't give up. Don't quit. You know, it's real easy to just throw in the towel and pull a demas. Just love the present world. You know, every, anybody that I've ever known that's quit church, they, you'll, if you hear from them after that, they'll just say, oh, it's so great. I feel so liberated. I feel like a weight has been removed. You know why they say that? Because it has. Because a weight has been removed. Because living the Christian life is a burden. Because you do have to endure afflictions. But does that mean that's, that's how you want to live your life, just without having to do anything difficult, without having to struggle? <clears throat> he says, continue. Don't quit. Continue the, thousands, the things which thou hast learned and been assured of. We're assured of the things that are to come. We're assured of these things. If we've learned them, we know whom we have believed in, and I'm persuaded that you're able to keep that which I have committed unto that day. We know these things. Knowing of whom thou hast learned, and learned them. You know, we know these things. We have to continue. Don't quit. Even when things wax worse and worse in the Christian life. <clears throat> you know, I'll wrap it up here, but uh, just look at verse 15 here. And he says in verse 15, And that from a child that thou hast, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, I kind of already touched on this, but I believe this is a verse, and this is kind of completely unrelated to everything else I've talked about. 
But he's saying there in verse 15, that I think that's a proof text that Timothy was saved when Paul found him. If you remember in Acts, when it says that Paul found him, there was a, uh, that Timothy was well reported of the brethren. Him would Paul have to go with him? He was well reported of the brethren because he was already saved and in church. Okay, that's what I believe. And here's another verse to back that up. Because from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. But what is he saying here in the context of what we're talking about? He's saying, continue, because you've known these things from a child. You know, you, you, you've been in this thing so long. You know, that's, that's, that's the most hard. I mean, when you see a, a, a kind of a babe in Christ kind of come or somebody who's kind of new to church and they're around for a little while and then they're kind of gone, it bothers you. It hurts. You're, you're disappointed. But man, when it's somebody that's you came to church and they were already there, they were the ones, they were the example that you looked to. They were somebody who you thought was rooted and built up and established in the faith. And then they quit. They decide not to continue in the things which they have learned and been assured of. Man, it's 10 times worse. You know, and, and stick around, it'll happen. And, it's, and I've, I've been around and I've seen it happen. And, and it's like, it's people you thought would never quit on God. They quit. And they always have their spiritual excuse as to why they, it was okay for them to quit on God and quit church or drop this standard or that standard or whatever. But Paul's saying, look, continue. You've, don't, you've known this from a child. Don't give up now. Timothy, this has been your whole life. You've known these things. Don't quit. And he goes on and says in verse 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. righteousness. So just kind of closing on a different note here, you know, is that what that verse shows us is that there's nothing that is not profitable in the Word of God. In Romans 1 is profitable today. Jude chapter 1, 2 Peter, profitable today. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah, profitable today. The story about Noah and, and the ark and everybody getting drowned, <laughs> profitable today. All Scripture is profitable. There's nothing in the Word of God. You can go read Leviticus about the sacrifices. It's profitable. There's things in there you can learn. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Everything we need to live for Christ is in the Bible. It's right there at our fingertips. If we're going to endure into the end, if we're going to suffer the persecutions, if we're going to be rooted and built up in Him, everything we need is right here in the Bible. And the man of God may be perfect, complete, whole, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It's everything we need is right there. You say, you know what? I want to endure the persecutions. I want to endure the afflictions. I want to, even though I know it's going to get worse and worse, I want to press toward the mark like Paul did and have all these attributes. How do I do it? It's right there. You can be furnished unto all good works by, by being rooted and built up in the Word of God, by being taught, by being instructed in the Word of God. But here's the thing, you know, you don't you just go home and put your pillow or put your Bible under your pillow at night and sleep on it and it just kind of seeps in. You have to open it, you have to read it, and you have to apply it. Everything we need is right here, but it's up to us to learn it and it's up to us to live it. Let's go ahead and pray.